All right, it's episode 767 of Let There Be Talk. It's Tuesday, and the episode is a day late. But technically, I work for myself, so it's not really late. Really, I could just put it out whenever I want it. But I don't do that to you, because you got to keep the momentum going. You got to have it every Monday. But... I had a uh, a long weekend, to say the least, right? If you've uh, been sleeping under a rock, if you're new to Let There Be Talk, if you're a new Dale Razor, welcome here. And um, it is, what is it, September 10th. Gertie, who are you barking at? Gertie's barking at someone. Gertie will bark at anything that walks by the front door which I guess is a good thing, you know? She only barks once. She goes, bark, and then goes, nah. <laughs> anyway, we all know why the uh, episode's late, or you don't really know. I mean, I was in Tennessee shooting a special over the weekend, and really the reason it's late was I flew in last night from Tennessee to L.A., got off the plane at 5.30, and if you haven't flown LAX in a long time, you got to take this stupid fucking shuttle over to this Uber Island, which takes about 15 minutes. And um, you get there. You can't order an Uber until you're there. They've got it jammed to where if you try, it just doesn't let you until the... The shuttle crosses this one area. And I was looking around and I think I saw like the, the discrambler, discrambler. I think I saw the points on the fence where as soon as you cross, you hit it and then you can order the Uber. I think they were having too many people ordering the Uber right when they got off the plane, not realizing it's a 15 minute ride on a shuttle. And then the Uber sitting there going, where are you? You know, so anyway, I got off the plane 530, got on the shuttle. And as soon as I crossed the, uh, the, the scrambler jammers, I ordered the Uber. I got off the shuttle. I'm standing there and I noticed an unusual amount of people, a couple hundred people at this Uber Island, which I never see. I never see more than maybe like 30 or 40, but this is like, it's jammed and it's Monday evening. And I'm thinking, well, I've never really been here on a Monday. Maybe it's like that on a Monday. I don't know. And I'm trying to order the Uber. And it's just doing the searching for driver. I'm going, what the fuck is going on? And all of a sudden, I hear this girl in her classic kind of entitled, you know, tone what the fuck, man? This is bullshit. <laughs> I was laughing. I was like, hmm, I don't know what's going on with her, but I'm still looking at my phone trying to get the Uber. I can't fucking believe this bullshit. And uh, I'm still kind of ignoring her. But after like 15 minutes, I have no fucking car. And now I've turned into the entitled woman next to me like what the fuck is going on you know and that's when i take my head out of my phone and look and everybody's heads are in their phone just staring like where's my car and as that happens here comes some guy in a shitty minivan and a couple of other cars and they pull in they roll down their windows and they go <laughs> they go uh you're not going to get any rides because we're fucking striking because Uber doesn't pay us. You're not getting rides. Fuck you. They're yelling at us. And some guy next to me just yells at, fuck you. I used to drive for Uber. Quit your crying. And I'm like, this is, this is insane. This is actually, uh, you know, this is getting hostile. It's crazy. So... I fucking, I, I don't even know what to do. You know, I'm just like, oh no, man. You know, like we're so used to Ubers. 
you know, and they, these guys are like, they're striking or there's some kind of thing. They've jammed the network. I, I mean, I've searched in the news trying to find it. And then I look, there's a, a, a cab line and uh, the taxi line is like two miles long. It looks like, and everybody has obviously abandoned Uber and now they're over in the taxis and the taxis are, you know, in heaven. Cause now they're like, we're just going to rob these fools. I'm there. Now it's like 30, 40 minutes. I'm in line for a cab. I'm not even close. I run into a woman that's kind of running the Uber aisle. And I said, Hey man, really what's going on? She goes, well, I guess there's some kind of dispute with Uber and there's just not enough drivers. And she goes, try Lyft again. Cause I'm driving Lyft and Uber. Neither of them. Now the apps aren't even opening. They're just like, mm, mm, just like sitting there. I've reset my phone. I doing anything I can. And I've seen the people that I first saw when I got to Uber Island, they're still there. And I'm going, Oh my God. Now I am completely exhausted. I'm out of gas. The complete one and a half years of touring that I've just kind of completed is just windfalled me. Now I'm just like, Oh God, I just need to get home. And all I kept thinking was, if I would have bombed on the special, I would be falling apart. But I will get into how good the special went in a minute. But I'll tell you this for this part of the story. It went great. So I was like, yeah, fuck it. It's kind of part of life. And this is the only problem I have with comedy is editing my podcast and travel. Other than that, my life is fucking fantastic. And I am not delusional. I have never been delusional of like, this sucks, man, because it doesn't suck. And I know that, and I'm not an idiot. And I never throw that out to people like, man, this is such bullshit. Just live in the dream, man. Living the dream is bullshit. <laughs> anyway, a couple more times on the lift, still nothing. Finally, an hour and five minutes I get a lift. It takes him about 20 minutes to get there. I get in the car. Now I'm in the heat of LA commute. It takes an hour for me to get home, which usually takes about 20 minutes. I get home. I see Gertie, uh, my dog, which I, I just, every time I come home and I get to see Gertie, I'm like, oh, Gertie. Usually she goes with me. She couldn't go with me to Tennessee. And, uh, I get in the house. I, I, I plan to eat dinner, but no, man, I'm out of gas. I have, it has taken its toll. I, and I go to bed and I wake up today around 8 AM, go back to bed. And then I just kind of, uh, I ended up doing a podcast that'll be out next Monday. It's a round table, uh, celebration of the, 20 year anniversary of Mark Lanigan's bubble gum, which is out on a box set now. So I did a full celebration of that. And, uh, so that'll be out next Monday. So I've been, I've been working all day today and I'm finally getting this episode going. Anyway, I just want to start by saying that, um, I'm coming up on the 15 year anniversary of doing comedy. December 6, 2009 was the first time I ever stepped on stage at no time in the first two or three years. Did I even think about anything like specials or TV spots or, you know, becoming a paid regular at clubs. I didn't think of any of that. Each day I woke up, I thought about, oh my God, I found something I love late in life and I can't believe it. I get to do it again today. I get to do it again today. Each day I wake up, I go get some stage time and battle those crazy learning, you know, demons of, you know, bombing and, or doing good, whatever. It was a long, long, long first couple years 
And it's been a long, incredible 15 years. It hasn't felt long, but 15 years is a long fucking time. When you think about how I played music for 25 years, I'm already at 15 on comedy. So it's, it's mind boggling to me. It really is. I wanted to do comedy when I was a kid. I didn't know how to get into it. I started playing music with some neighborhood high school friends. And next thing you know, 25 years went by, like I've said over and over. But then late in life, I, you know, I go down this, this crazy path of doing some movies by luck and then landing this Ice Cube film, meeting these three comedians, Michael Collier, Earthquake, and Garrett Morris, starting comedy at the Comedy Store at 44, walking on that patio, no idea what the fuck I was doing. And here I was getting on a plane to Tennessee to go shoot my first special. And I think back about it. Somebody wrote me and said, well, what happened to that record you did? Marin used to climb it. You did two records and you didn't put them out. What happened to that? Then other people, oh, you did a Netflix, Bill Burr's Funny Friends or Bill Burr's Friends That Kill. You got cut out of that. What happened to that? What's going on with you? And there's really this kind of uh, probably undertone around the community of like, yeah, he's funny, man, but you know, he doesn't have a manager. He doesn't have an agent. He doesn't have a special. He's been doing it 15 years. And, you know, the game's changed. He's not putting clips out. He's not, you know. But I had thought about it for a long time. And, you know, I did the, did the record at the Comedy Works in 2007 with Tom Rothrock, the great, great producer on um, Bongload Records. And, you know, it went great, but it, it, it just, it wasn't it. It just, it had no dynamics. It just sounded fake. It was like people were laughing and screaming. And right at that fucking moment, about two weeks later, I had become a better comedian by just two new bits. And then I was like, do I really want this to represent me? You know? And, and at the time, people weren't just putting shit out, you know, like clips and all that. So... I was like, you know what? I'll 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 shelve this one. And also there was kind of a weird deal between Bong uh Bong Load, you know, Tom Rothrock being my uh incredible friend, but there was this kind of thing where I was going to be paying for my vinyl and stuff. So I was like, why why would I do that? I'll just I'll uh it was Tom's partner, not Tom, but he was like, Yeah, you pay us, we make the records, and then we we split it. And I was like, how about you pay for it? We make the records and we split it, you know, but, uh, so, you know, I, uh, I, I put it, I put it on the shelf and then a few years went by and I decided I'm going to try it again. I'll do it at, um, La Jolla comedy store. I'm going to do a record for Sirius XM so I can get some comedy on the comedy channels. And I did that with uh, Manny. We did it all analog with Neve preamps and everything, and it was great. But I, I didn't like I didn't like the material. I liked some of the material, but I didn't dig the whole hour. And I, you know, I know people are like, just put it out. People just put shit out, even if it's not good, you know. And I had that conversation with David tell at the comedy cellar out front on the stairs. And he just said, Hey man, just remember that shit's out there forever. I didn't put anything out for the first 15 years. And then I put skanks for the memories. You'll know when you're ready. Don't, don't worry about it. I wasn't worried about it, but I will tell you this. I could feel the, clubs and everything it was getting harder and harder to get booked on uh road dates 
And I could tell it was like time. It was time to fucking get something going. I was smashing it when I was on stage. I was doing really good. I really liked the material. And I thought, you know what, man? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot a special. And I'm going to take some old, some new. And I'm going to put together my favorite material and, uh, and get ready for it. So in my mind, I, I wrote down the bits I wanted to do. And I started out on the road. Of course, I was out working with Bill. And I was doing 20, 25 minutes on that tour. But in between that, I would headline places. And I'd start to put together what I felt would be uh, a great, great representation of the last 15 years of what I've been doing. There's bits that are 10 years old that I still love that were incredible that maybe 20,000 people maybe saw. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll relearn those kind of bits. I'll, I'll have all this new stuff. And then I'll, I'll figure out how to put it in an order that just feels like this great thread of 15 years. So, you know, I went and headlined Acme, six shows. I went to Springfield, Missouri and did four shows. I went to San Diego. I did flappers one night and, uh, and it started to come together. I could really feel the order. And then it really, it really came together about a week ago at Flappers. And, you know, I headlined one night at the store and I didn't like the order. So I'm glad I did that because I go, this is not the order. This is the material, but this isn't the order. And to have a really good special, it's got to be like a great LP where the the order of the songs make the LP just as much as the songs. Imagine your favorite record. Imagine Van Halen one and you just switch some songs around or imagine like Prince Purple Rain, you switch some songs around. It would feel weird to find the ultimate, you know, order. The flow is it's a, it's a, it's a magic and it's really, it, it doesn't seem to matter as much anymore in the music world because it's just streaming and singles and, you know, swiping and flipping and whatever. But back in the day, you would really work on the order of your record. You would put together a cassette or a CD and go, let's try this order. And you'd listen through it and you go, that's pretty good, but it kind of feels like it takes a dip here. And so then you re, you know, configure the order. You burn the CD or cassette again, you know, record the set, put it in your car, drive around. You go, that's pretty good. But what if we put this one song on side two to open side two? You had to deal with side two back then too, which is another, you know, fucking gem. I think my strongest and I and no and no um, way do I ever say I'm fucking funny or, or I'm great. And I think the big, big problem in comedy, and I thought about it on the flight home, was when you're a newer comic, you're in the game with people that are 30 and 35 years in, and a lot like music too, but more with comedy where somebody can watch a special with Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr or, you know, these legends, uh, Norm MacDonald, and then they'll go to your special. And without knowing the history of how long you've been doing it, are you a new comic or anything? And then they'll just look at it like, well, this guy's not as good as that. And it's like, hey, man, you know, if I was as good as the legends, which I, I feel like I've worked with a lot of the legends and I'm, I do good opening. If I was as good as them, you know, at their fucking level, I would be probably 30 years in, you know, it's, it takes a long time to figure out 
how to create an incredible thread in your set. It just does. And, and I really feel in like the last year, I'm starting to turn a page on figuring out orders really good. You know, like there's these levels of comedy as you're going along, you're like doing open mics. You're like, ah, fuck, I don't know. And then you go, oh shit, I got a good 10 minutes. And then it feels like a whole couple years goes by and you're like, I'm not getting anywhere, man. I'm not. And then boom, you go, holy shit, man. I kind of got like a, I kind of got, got a good 30 minutes here. And then you, you have to try to start learning headlining, which is the most insane animal of comedy headlining, running an hour, being able to keep somebody's interest, which is a hundred percent almost impossible in the last 10 years of cell phones before the cell phones, probably a little easier because people are engaged. Since the cell phones, it's almost impossible to keep somebody for an hour. So I feel like this part of my career, I've, I've figured out how to really put together a great order, a thread. And, you know, I did the store, I headlined, I ran the set, and then I was like, mm, that's not there. And then the, the genius of it is if you can listen to your set, which is hard as fuck to listen to yourself sitting there. Okay, let's listen to this. If you can listen to it as an audience member and just be like, oh, oh I wish he would have done this part here or figure out the art of callbacks. And I've said it before with the, with the yonder bags and the phones being locked up, you can do callbacks. Without that, the callback is dead. The callback is an art of comedy. And uh, Louis C.K. being one of the best at callbacks I've ever seen. There is a, a, an art to putting together the ultimate set. And so I felt in the last week, it just hit me. In a two-day period, I was like, if I just move this stuff here, this thing's gonna fucking flow. And I wanna, I wanna, I wanna put this out there because I feel so good about this special for me that it reminds me of when I put my uh record out that I my music record. I don't really, I want people to like it, but I don't really worry about that because I honestly feel this is the best version of me right now. And that's exactly what you want to put out. So if somebody goes, ah, you fucking hack, this shit sucks. You go, yeah, man, say what you want. I like it. And I listened to my record. I said it a few episodes ago. I hadn't listened to it in 10 years. And I put on my CD as I went hiking and I was like, fuck, this is good, man. I like it. So I feel what I did last uh, two nights ago in Grundy County, Tennessee is something that I like. And that's really all that matters. I'll tell you, it was a, it was a magic, magic night. We flew in on Saturday morning to Nashville, Tennessee. Bill and I, Club Soda Kenny, got on the plane from Los Angeles, flew to Nashville, got to Nashville about seven in the evening, four hour flight, uh, time change, rented a car, and we drove out to the caverns, which is exactly an hour and 20 minutes from Nashville or an hour or so from Chattanooga. So you can fly into either one, but you got to fly to Nashville. So you get the direct flight. We get to the hotel, we check in, we eat a, a, a nice dinner and some friends are there. The director, Marcus Price is there. Uh, Gracie's there, his uh, uh, producing partner. 
my manager, Brian Klein's there. And uh, Bill, Club Soda Kenny, and my good friend, Steve McDonald. We're all there. We're eating. We're sitting around this fireplace in this hotel that's like a giant lodge. It looks a little bit like The Shining meets uh, New uh, Newhart, his, his inn. And immediately I noticed how incredibly polite people were in this area. In all of Tennessee, it was wild. I was talking to this one woman. And I said, you want to come to the show? And she didn't understand what I was saying. And she said, sir, like, excuse me, was sir. I hadn't heard anything like that ever. And, and yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, you know, hello, all of that. It was so crazy. I realized something. I really, really like Tennessee, man. I, um, you know, my good friend Jay Buchanan lived there for uh, years from Rivals, but he ended up moving back to L.A. And he did say something. Once you're a California guy, it's it's tough to go somewhere and stay forever. But, man, Tennessee is just beautiful. I love East Nashville. I love Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, all of that. But this area we were in, Grundy County, it was it looked like, I mean, I'm going to tell you this right now. I had no clue that the caverns were in the middle of fucking nowhere. I just figured it was like these caves I saw on the way to Sturgis. They're off the freeway. Like you're riding to Sturgis, you'll see it. Do a cave tour and you take an exit. And you, you, you know, it's like right there and you go tour a cave. This was in the middle of fucking nowhere. There was a college out there called the University of the South. And really, that's it. There were a lot of fucking small little snake kissing looking churches. You know, the, there were people that had gravestones in their front yard because you're in the middle of nowhere. And it's like their families just buried in their in their yard. We were in the middle of nowhere, a lot of one lane roads. So I was like, oh shit, man. I'm surprised that people are coming out here. So I had not been to the venue. I've never been in the venue. I've never seen a group in the venue. I've never heard what it's like. I'm taking a giant fucking gamble. It is almost insane. My dog's over here chewing up. What are you doing over there, Gertie? Gertie, what are you doing? It's almost insane to shoot a special in a venue you've never been in. It's just crazy, you know? Gertie's, Gertie's laying down. It's kind of hot in here because I don't got the AC on because I'm podcasting. But to do that is unheard of. Like, yeah, let's shoot a special there. You ever been there? Nope. Well, what if the fucking laughs? What if you can't hear them? What if it's... uh? a cave and it's all echoey or what if uh, it's cold or what if it's hot in there? Or what if, what if the, the audience doesn't show up, but just everything. So we go to bed, we eat a great dinner, we hang out, we go to bed and we get up in the morning and we eat breakfast and we're shooting the shit. And then I get in the car and take a ride over to the venue, which is exactly 26 minutes from the hotel. So I'm just like, we are in the middle of deliverance land. Just crazy. We drive there, we park. There's like a, a, a big trailer and then another trailer. And then there's an outdoor amphitheater out there that is fucking stunning. That I immediately was like saying, I want to do the Bond Bash out here as a festival, a two-day festival. Outdoor holds 6,000. Beautiful. Looks like a mini Woodstock. Just grassy hill, trees everywhere. And then they got these cabins and tents and everything. And I was like, look, we could do the Bond Bash. It'd be Bond Scott Bash, maybe Marcus King Band, Rival Sons on a Saturday. And then the Friday night would be comedy in the caverns. 
full comedy in the caves with like five comedians. That hit me right away. I want to do that. So I put my bags down and I walk into the cavern and I filmed it. You saw. And as I went in, I was just fucking floored. And I was, I was looking at it like, I can't even believe we're doing the special in here. And that's when it really hit me of like, this is it, man. This is a special special. If you can make the people laugh, if you can kill the cave and the background and the ambiance is going to shoot the thing through the fucking stratosphere. But I also had the amazing pressure of if I don't get this, it could be over for me. It really could because people were like, they whisper and they whisper loud. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went out there in the fucking caverns, you know, Did, didn't fucking get it. Didn't get it, man. You know, he, he put that, he recorded that one record. He shelved it. Then he, then he did the, the record at the comedy store in Oha or uh, La Jolla. Didn't get it. And then he, he got cut out of that Bill Burr Netflix thing, which by the way, I've said a thousand times, thank God I did. And then he went to the fucking caverns, you know, Bill went out there with him and he got his buddy Marcus Price to direct and all his friends flew out. Greg Riley was there and Brian, the boot maker and court McCowan, everybody was there and he didn't get it. That was fucking on me. Burr said something, he goes, man, we're in the gym and you didn't ask me anything like, Hey, any recommendations, any, uh, any, um, you know, thoughts on what I should do or whatever. He goes, I thought either you're shit in your pants or you were just completely like, you know, non-phased. And I would say about 70, nah, maybe about 85% of me was non-phased because I believed in the material so much in the order. And I had just had this amazing weekend in Springfield, Missouri, four shows. And the last show on the Saturday night, really tweaking the order. I was like, as long as that audience is in there, I've opened for bill for the last, you know, six years. Bill Burr's audience is fucking fantastic. They're not blockheads. It's not a papered room. It's not fucking bachelorette parties. It's not random contest winners. They're Bill Burr's fans, and they're also uh, my fans. There's a lot of my fans in there that listen to the podcast, are on Patreon, everything. So I thought, you know what, man? If it's the if it's those people, this material in this room, it's gonna fucking work. So I, I really, uh, I really was, I was pretty goddamn confident and I was really emotional because I knew, like I said, if I didn't get it, I would probably be done. So I stay at the venue for the whole day. I decide I'm not going back to the hotel. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to eat a little lunch. I'm going to walk around, <clears throat> excuse me walk around the venue. I'm going to take it in. I'm going to think about the last 15 years. I'm going to think about when I got passed at the store. I'm going to think about when I got passed at the comedy cellar. I'm going to think about the first time I headlined the Denver comedy works. I'm going to think about the Hollywood bowl with bill. I'm going to think about Madison square garden. I'm going to think of the trajectory of how each year it's gotten better and better. I'm going to think about the Patreoners the podcast uh, listeners. Uh, I talked to Joey Diaz on the phone. I talked to, you know, so many people were hitting me, emailing me going, good luck, man, tear it up. There was so many people on my side. I was like, I'm going to do this. So Bill gets to the venue around five. We eat dinner. We hang out. First shows at 630. 
total fucking early bird special. Now, traditionally, an early show before 7.30 is always kind of rough because it's early. Sun's out and shit. But the early show sold out first. So I was like, well, the early show is loaded with the real super fans. And when the fans walk in, now remember, this is a location that is 70% destination fans, meaning 70% of the ticket sales are people that flew or drove there. We met people that drove six hours. We met this couple. They had a cool French bulldog named Frank and they drove six hours. I met this other person, drove five hours. Uh, Brian, the bootmaker, flew in from uh, Los Angeles. Greg Riley flew in from San Diego. Steve flew in from the Bay Area. Um, tons of people. Marcus went out there, Marcus Price, the director, to get the audience a little pep talk. Like, okay, here's what we're going to do. There's cameras in here. Don't get out of your seat. You know, we're filming. You're going to be part of this. How many people drove 500 or traveled 500 miles? We got some good round of applause. How many people traveled a thousand miles? Got a good round of applause. How about 2000 miles? Fucking shit loads of people. Now, when he's doing that, I'm starting to get fucking choked up. I realized I put this together two months ago. I had Todd Mayo, the owner of the caverns on the podcast as soon as that podcast was done, we got on the phone together. We put it together. My manager, Brian, flew to San Jose to talk to Bill about it. Bill said, you ain't doing a club. You're doing the caverns. Book it. Let's fucking do it. We found the date. We couldn't do the Saturday because it had uh, Bill had something to do. So we had to do the Sunday. We booked it. and uh, And here we go. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of choked up. The people are here. They come into the venue. You see it. You're like, what the fuck is this? Marcus has worked two days on getting the camera angles, the lighting guys, Reggie, all these guys there have put together this incre incredible lighting. So Bill goes up. He does like 20. And then he tells the crowd, look, I'm going to bring up one of my best friends. He's going to shoot his first special ever. It's the first special ever to be shot in this cave. And I love the guy. And as he's saying that, I'm starting to choke up. I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to cry. You know, which, by the way, I had just an hour before mistakenly ate off the uh there's a like a food truck there and now i'm in my head like what am i doing why would you eat off a food truck look it's clean but what if it's not it's a food truck what if i eat that and then right before i go up i got food poisoning also bill said i was going to surprise you and i was going to rent a couple motorcycles and we were going to run uh, ride to the gig but he thought I don't want to do that because what if we get in an accident or something and he can't shoot a special? So everything's going through our heads. Then I'm like, what if I, what if I would have caught like COVID or something, you know, anything? Cause the people are there. The stage is set. It, the fucking work has been intense for two months to get it ready. So he brings me up. And I walk, it's a long walk up to the cave. It's long uh, to the stage from the back. And I walk on and I turn and I look out at the crowd. It's totally sold out. The lighting is lit them up. They're kind of red and, and purples. And, and I just, I, I, for a second there, I just, I was honest. I said, man, I, I feel like I'm going to cry. I, 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 this is, nobody wanted to give me a special 15 years, I'm grinding my ass off. This is fucking insane. And the audience is like, yeah. And then I just kind of grab it and I go. And for the entire set, I'm just 
fucking, I mean, I am on just thinking the flow is perfect. It's coming out. The audience is laughing like crazy. All of the fucking bits are working. Even the Beatles bit, which I have, which is for me. I do this Beatles bit strictly for me. And if the audience gets it, I fucking love the audience even more. They love the Beatles bit. I am cooking along. And next thing you know, the first set is done. And I got my second standing O in my life. My first standing O was years ago at the Denver Comedy Works when I headlined. I got a, set, a standing O and Bronston Jones got a picture of it through the curtain. And uh, standing O's, Bill gets them religiously when we're on the road. I see him get them all the time. But I got a standing O, the whole audience. I think the first guy that popped up was Greg Riley, who's been with me the entire career. Just a super fan, but I don't call him a super fan because he is a friend. I saw him pop up. Then I saw another guy pop up. And then the whole audience just started popping up. And I was just, I was devastated. I was just like, I can't believe I got it. That's all I kept thinking. It was, I got it. You know, but I was like, oh shit, I got a second show, but I got it. And when you're shooting a special, I don't know. I haven't show, shot a lot of specials, but I do know that when you get it in the first one, the weight is off your shoulders to where you just go the second one. And the second one could even end up being better because you're like, I already got it. So whatever happens, happens, you know? So it's, uh, you know, I walk off, I go up to the trailer, Bill, and, and uh, all my friends are there. They're like, you fucking killed, you got it. And I was like, yeah. And then Bill, by the way, goes back on. He, he does another 20 minutes. So Bill goes on, then I do it. And then Bill goes back on and finishes the show. So he comes back on. And then he, after the show, the first show, we're all sitting around. He's like, you fucking got it. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I was just I was just full of joy. And uh, Marcus is like, dude, you killed, man. So then we seat the room again, second show. And we do it all over again. And the second show was fantastic. But I got to tell you, I'm a firm believer of going with the organic, you know, the, the organicness of the first one, of not knowing what it's going to sound like, not knowing what it's going to go like, and just the excitement and the craziness. I mean, dude, I was, I was fucking jacked. I was doing act outs, you know, I was, ah, I was on man. And, uh, the second show was fantastic. Uh, the crowd was amazing on that too. So we got two great, great performances and, um, we're going to look at them this week and then we'll start editing them and um and doing the uh, mix on the audio and then the color correction and then we'll shop it around and see who wants to buy this now if no one wants to buy it no big deal because i will put it out on youtube and patreon first probably and then um and then move on to shoot another one i want to shoot a 30 minutes in the next eight months or so i want to put out two in a year I'm, I'm, I'm good. I got this fucking monkey off my back and I feel really good, really good that I waited this long. I think, you know, like I always say it, uh, with my, uh, audit, my music record, I have no cringe worthy moments on there. And same with my Conan set. When I did Conan, I could watch it right now. And I go, I still love that set. It's not like, Oh God, I'm way better now. That, that material. I love that Conan set. And I love uh, this special I just shot. Um, I'm not going to tell you the name of it. I've already named it, but I will, you know, uh, tell you later when it's released what the name means. And uh, there you go, man. I'll tell you the one of the greatest things that happened that night. We went back to the hotel and we sat around and Bill was just, he was just so fucking, so kind to us man he's like dude you got it 
he loved working with Marcus. He loved Brian, my manager, everybody there. He's just like, dude, congrats, man. In the morning, they went to breakfast. I slept in. I came in to the restaurant at the hotel and they were all giving me a round of applause. And I almost cried again. I was just like, oh man, there's my fucking family there. I don't have family. My family is gone. My mom, this one was for my mom. This one was for me. And this one was for Bill, you know, just so he could be like, you know what? This guy fucking kills and I'm going to, I'm going to help him. So after we eat, Bill's like, Hey man, let's take a little uh, walk out here. There's about a, a mile long road here that takes you out to this uh, Tennessee Valley. I go, yeah, I want to do that. So he and I ate and we walked for about a mile. We're just in this woods. There was a mid-century house there. It's fucking knocking me out. There was another house with an old Karma Gia that had all this patina on it. The, the, the road was absolutely silent. There was no car sounds. There was no airplanes. There was no helicopters. It was silent. There was just a, you know, just a slight little breeze. And we got to the end of the road and there was this bench and Bill and I just sat there and we were just quiet looking out like, I don't know, 50 miles or something. It was just the valley. It looked like the ocean, but it was just trees. It was the Tennessee Valley. It was beautiful. And we just sat there and I thought the juxtapose of last night to this is mind boggling. And we just sat there, man. And then after about a half hour, he got up and he's like, let's go home. And we headed back and packed and flew home, man. And uh, I will never forget it. I'm looking forward to you guys seeing it. I think you're going to absolutely love the look of it. Marcus Price, he just directed the Keith Robinson pod, uh, special called Different Strokes. And he killed it on that and he killed it on this. And, um, you know, I can't wait for you guys to see it. And it'll take a little bit because we want to see if somebody wants to buy it. Unfortunately, the fucking holidays are coming up. Hollywood closes from Thanksgiving to like January 15th, the business. But I think if we get a good, good edit, we can start shopping it in the next month. And maybe find out if somebody wants to buy it. I don't think, I, I, I just don't see this not selling because even if you weren't even into the material, you would look at it and go, oh, well, we got to put this out because nobody's done a special in a cave. So people are going to be talking about it, you know, like, oh, you seen that special in the cave? But then, you know, I feel great about it. So they're like, yeah, I saw the special in the cave and the guy was fucking funny. That's what I hope they say. <laughs> anyway, so there it is. There it is, 15 years, and a lot of you have really, you know, made, you know, made me push hard, and uh, you make me each week keep going for it with the podcast and the comedy, and, and your support has been unbelievable out there. Woo! Man, oh, I will tell you this. If you live in California, this is not announced yet, but I'm going to uh, give you a little heads up. Bill and I are doing a little uh, California tour of the old theaters in November. We're going to be doing like the Fox theaters up and down the Highway 99. We're going to be doing Ojai, Bakersfield, Modesto, Visalia, Fresno. Uh, unbelievable shows in these old theaters and we're going to just be out there working on some new material and having fun. So, uh, that's a little, a little tip for you. And then I will be at the La Jolla comedy store headlining in November. I believe I'm also doing new year's Eve at the, uh, comedy cellar in Vegas. And what else do I got? I guess that's about it for the road shows. Don't forget to join my Patreon, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. 
Uh, I'm going to be putting up a couple little sneaker clips on the Patreon so you can see what the special looks like. Maybe put one joke up. And uh, I want to thank you guys all big time from the bottom of my heart for uh, just being there all these years. I really, I really appreciate it. Let's see. I think that's about it for now. Um, yeah, that looks about it, my friends. I'm really tired still, but uh, I'll be at the comedy store tonight and Friday night. I'm going to go see Sturgill Simpson Saturday night. I'm going to a concert. And uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. Tour dates will be up on dndelray.com. And I really appreciate it. And if you came out to the special, you came out to the shooting like Bobby Snakes. Hold on, let me get some of this. Uh, I want to give the new Patreon as a shout out, actually. Patreon.com slash Dean Delray. Some new Patreons. Neil Fish, Cooch Stanton, Chris Hardgrove, Claire and Eric Johnson. Which, by the way, Chris Hardgrove gets the Patreon of the Month Award. Thank you for joining up, everybody. There's a new bonus episode on there. Let me see. It's number... Uh, what is the episode? It's number 164 bonus episode. I talk about the Oasis reunion, Jeff Buckley's Grace album, Turning 30, and my fight with Acid Reflex, which I'm still battling and trying to figure out. And in the next month, I'm hoping to uh, conquer this silent reflex and get it taken care of. I, I can't be having my voice fucking fried. Anyway, candles are lit, my friends. I love you guys. See you uh, out there on the highway.